Okay? Okay, let's get started. Uh, I have an announcement before uh, this uh, last talk of Nati. The, this afternoon is going to be a special session to felicitate the physics contributions of uh, Kumar Narayan, who is one of the main organizers, who has been one of the main organizers of the school for the last 25 years. Uh, I urge all of you to uh, attend it. It will be a kind of, it will give you a perspective on the more uh, the history of string theory a little bit and also the more classical uh, uh, classical period of string theory when world sheet was important, modular inverse was important. Uh, so you haven't heard anything about that during this school, but uh, this session will give you kind of a new, different perspective about string theory. Uh, so I encourage everybody to attend it. And now we'll start with uh, uh, the last lecture of now. So even though they updated it up there, they still insist that I give the same talk that I gave yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but I will not. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, maybe. What's that? It's not a bad idea for some of us. It will be what? It will not be a bad idea for some of us. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> but I have no problem. You know, I, I'm about uh, at the end of lecture two out of four that I planned. <laughs> so I, it doesn't, I, I'm not going to, to finish my notes anyway. I need more chalks. The more longer chalks. OK, good. So yesterday, we discussed the, is something bad with the sound? Is some feedback? OK. Uh, The words, we started discussing dualities and we discussed particle vortex duality and just by manipulating the standard particle vortex duality we derived the new boson-boson duality which looked a lot, this theory that we studied was a gauge, West, a gauge Wilson Fisher model that we denoted like that and I'll symbolically write it like that so that I tune Phi, the coefficient of phi squared to zero, and what I really mean by that, there's no symmetry at the point phi squared equals zero, so what I really mean by tuning is that I tune it to the fixed point of the infrared theory. And different people might have different regularizations, and then what they mean by mu squared in the Bell Lagrangian would be different, but what is meaningful is that there is a fixed point, and what I call mu equals zero is being at the fixed point. So this way, if you and I have different regularizations and you define your mu one way and I define my another way, once we found the fixed point, we can both adjust what we mean by mu, such that mu equals zero is the fixed point. So I did not include it. Also, the coefficient of phi to the fourth, we let it flow all the way to the infrared. So it's no longer a parameter in the theory. So I'll denote it schematically by one. But what I really mean is that we start with the Lagrangian as last time with the phi square, in with the phi to the fourth, we flow to the infrared, we tune mu, and we call that mu equals zero. So this is shorthand for all that. And we also said that we add here i over four pi BDB. So it's not just the Wilson-Fisher fixed point coupled to a gauge field with the Chern-Simons level one. And we added to it, coupling to background field, two pi BDA, so this is what you really mean by that, is this theory in the UV that there might be a gauge coupling for B and there might be a mu, mu term and a lambda phi to the fourth and we flow to the infrared and we look for the fixed point. We readjust what the parameters are. And in the end, we have this theory that doesn't have a free parameter. It has a global U1 symmetry. A is our device to probe the global U1 symmetry. It's a classical field. And the claim yesterday was that this whole thing in the infrared is the same as a free fermion coupled to the same background field psi. So in the past five minutes, I fulfilled the requirement of the organizers that I re-give last talk. And I also, the requirement from here, or the request that I give it again. So now we can proceed. And what we'll do now is use another trick, 
which is the same trick essentially that we used yesterday, that once we have one duality, we can plug it in and do the same manipulations on both sides and derive many other dualities. So again, we have this duality. Recall we derived the boson, we started from a well-established boson-boson duality. We actually derived from it another boson-boson duality, which is essentially this theory with some signs flipped and some added term, classical terms. And then we said this looks like a fermion, so that's an assumption. We are going to assume this duality, and now I'm going to derive consequences. For the rest of the talk, I will just derive consequences of this duality, and I'll derive many other dualities, and we'll present checks on the other dualities, and if any of them fails, it would mean that this duality is wrong. As long as they are checked, then this gives us more confidence in this duality. It did. It did. It did. So the, there's a question of whether you mean the particle or the operator. I'm, I'm answering your question. So you can mean two different things in the question. One is, what, are the, what is the map of operators? Can somebody sitting in the UV, in the bosonic theory, identify an operator psi? That's a way to interpret your question. So let me answer that. In fact, I did it yesterday. I say that on this side of the duality, we can consider a monopole operator for B. It's not a soliton. It's a monopole operator. And because of this term, it is charged under the U1 symmetry of B. So we multiply by phi or phi dagger, depending on your conventions. And we argued yesterday that this is mapped to the operator psi. So in the UV, you can really see the operator psi. So even in the UV here, where the theory is interacting and complicated, you can see that it has an operator, which has spin a half. It's a fermion. It carries charge one under the U1 asymmetry, but it's not free. So in the UV, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. I'm trying to answer your question. So there is such an operator in the UV. It has spin a half and charge one, and it satisfies a very complicated equation of motion claim is that in the infrared, the equation of motion of this fermionic operator is that of a free fermion. That's a non-trivial dynamical statement. The fact that there exists an operator of spin a half and charge one, that's easy to establish. And that's true in the UV here. The claim of the duality is not that this theory in the UV is the same as this. It's only the infrared is the same. So we identify this. Kind of. Another way, let me finish, and then you can ask your question. Another way to interpret your question is about states in the Hilbert space. But one thing at a time. This thing has been going on for some 30 years. <laughs> when they were still in Russia, and I had not seen him, we had a very long email exchange. And it took three weeks each way with long letters written long, long hand. And the style was exactly like this. <laughs> and I was younger. I don't know whether he was younger then or not. <laughs> so another way to interpret your question is about the states. So the operators are always defined in the UV. They are independent of what the parameters are and so forth. The parameters determine which phase the theory will be in. They determine the spectrum in the infrared. That's a separate question. So let's discuss the parameters and the phases. So we said that the operator psi bar psi is mapped to the operator phi absolute value square, or maybe with a minus sign. Doesn't matter. So that's still in the UV. This is the map of operators. Now we discuss states. In order to discuss states, we need to know which phase we are in. And we discussed yesterday three phases. One is mu equals zero. That's a transition point where this theory has a fixed point and this theory has a fixed point. In this language, the fixed point is a free field theory. In this language, we don't know. And the claim is that it is free. At that point, the states are massless particles, so it's very confusing what we're talking about. So we should better be in one of the other phases to formulate your question precisely. 
And there are two phases, depending on whether mu is positive or negative. In this side of the duality, when mu is positive, we have a fermion with positive mass. And when mu is negative, we have a fermion with negative mass. And they each have spin a half, and they either spin this way or that way, because we are in two dimensions. And there is an anomaly that tells us that these two states are not exactly the same. But there is one free massive fermion. Now we go to this side of the duality. And now I'm getting closer to your question. Can I see this state, not operator, fermion that I see here? And I explained yesterday that depending on the sign of mu, the answer here is different. But in both cases, we see a fermion. For one sign, for positive sign, the spectrum includes phi quanta. There are phi particles. The phi particles are the excitations in the spectrum. Mu is positive. Make it much bigger than anything else. You have phi particles. But the phi particles are charged under little b. So we have to be a little bit careful about them. And little b is a gauge field, which was not Higgs. So its dynamics is important. And it has churn simon stern. A massive scalar field coupled to a churn simon stern acquires fractional spin and fractional statistics. So phi itself acquires spin a half. And therefore, it's a fermion. And we can also check that it has a charge 1 under big A. In the other phase, it's even closer to your question. Because in the other phase, what happens is that phi condenses. Once phi condenses, two things happen. First, it hickses the gauge symmetry. So from this point on, all the subtleties with churn simons terms are not present. But what we get in return is that this is the abelian Higgs model, and it has vortices, which I think were mentioned in one of the talks yesterday, maybe even yours, or maybe Misha's. These vortices are strings in three plus one dimensions, and they are particles in two plus one dimensions. So this system with negative mu has vortices. And if you go through the analysis there, you see that these vortices have spin a half and charge one on the big A. So they have precisely the right quantum numbers to be the free fermion in the other description. Now you can ask your question again if I did not answer it. OK, thank you. OK, so this is officially now the end of lecture three. And we are going to manipulate this duality. And the trick of manipulation will be exactly the same as we did yesterday. And this is the main trick in this game. So we are going to add terms to the two sides of the duality and convert A, the classical field, to a dynamical field. And specifically, the theory we would like to understand, this is a free fermion coupled to a classical gauge field. We would like to study three-dimensional QED, namely a fermion coupled to a gauge field. So once we have the duality, we'll be able to give a bosonic description of this theory. Because wherever we see psi with a covariant derivative, we'll just use the right-hand side. So let me do that. So I'm going to add to the two sides of the dualities, to, of the duality, I'm going to add i over 2 pi, a db. And whenever we add a new gauge field, we can add So I, the idea is to promote A to be a dynamical field. So whenever we have a dynamical field, we always have a classical field coming together with it that couples to it like that. And we also, nobody can stop me from adding 1 over 4 pi BDB. You will soon see why I did that. So we just add that to the two sides of the duality. So the duality is like an equation. We can add the same thing on both sides. So it's still true. And here it's trivially true because these are classical terms. They don't affect the dynamics at all. Now, since the duality is true for every A, I can integrate over A. So the way I do that is by replacing A by lowercase a. So on the left side of the duality, I have this. That was there before. And I'm adding i over 2 pi. And B is now a new classical field. So I've just done that. So this is QED coupled to a classical background field. 
that for some reason has a BDB, which so far it looks totally unnecessary. On the other side of the duality, we have many more terms. So let me copy. Have that. And now we have plus i over 4 pi ddb plus i over 2 pi dda. There's something wrong with my signs, I think. Okay, that's okay. Plus i over 4 pi, sorry, 1 over 2 pi, terms I added there, except that now a is going to be little a. I added a db plus i over 4 pi. So what have I done? I added to this thing to the two sides. And wherever I saw big A, I replaced it with little a, which is shorthand for I'm going to integrate over A. A is going to be a dynamical field. But now we can do the same thing we did yesterday. We look at the terms in A. So the terms that A multiply, A appears only linearly on this side. Since A appears linearly, it's easy to integrate it out. So the general rule is that whenever we have e to the i minus i over 2 pi a dx, x is whatever it is, then the functional integral over x gives us a delta function of, delta functional integral over a gives me a delta function of x. This is a trivial theory. You can think of it as being a Lagrange multiplier that forces x to be trivial. So if I just look at these terms, they tell me that b is minus b. Yes? Of? Right, but with the coefficient here, so what does it mean? So it's clearly a delta function of the derivative. That means that dx is 0. That's obvious. But I claim that it really means that x is a pure gauge. So dx equals 0 is weaker than saying that x is a pure gauge. I also need to worry about the holonomies. But that depends on the specific normalization. Since a is not really a number, but it's a connection, then a might not be single value. So it might be, I might need transition functions in a. And when I a integrate over these, that really sets x to be 0. And what I mean by that is a pure gauge. So that was a good question. And so now I can integrate out, and I forget about this, and I can forget about that. And I can also forget about little b, because it's the same as plus b. So these two terms cancel. This becomes big B. And I might have messed up a sign, but Oh, I see my mistake. I had a minus sign here yesterday. Quality I wanted. So with this minus sign, I have it here. So now b is minus b. I can cancel these two terms. And what I'm left with, so now I'll do it on the blackboard. This theory with a lot of fields boils down to up to redefining what I mean by b, db phi square plus phi to the fourth, and everything else cancels out. So what do we see here? On the left-hand side, we see QED, the theory which is also known as U1 level a half because of the parity and number. This is a standard theory that there is huge literature on it with different number of flavors, and there is really huge literature on that. And on the right-hand side, we find the Wilson-Fisher or, or the O2, or the, the O2 Wilson-Fisher model or the XY model. This result is extremely surprising. It's extremely surprising for a number of reasons. First of all, QED in three dimensions, so forget the coupling to B for that matter, 
just a free fermion coupled to a ga gauge field is a strongly coupled theory. And it is controversial what this theory does in the infrared. In fact, lattice people have not yet converged on what it does. There are people who claim that there is a first order transition. There are people who claim that psi bar psi gets an expectation value. We have a claim here. I know it might not be right, but the claim is very specific. This theory has a second order point. It's a non-trivial fixed point. And not only is it a fi non-trivial fixed point, it's a well-studied, well-known fixed point. This is the XY model. That's the first reason this is surprising. There's a controversy in the literature of whether such a fixed point exists at all. And we claim not only does it exist, it's a theory that everybody is familiar with. And if you're not familiar with the XY model, you should be. So this is a well-studied model. It describes things in nature. There are measurements in the lab measuring the critical exponents of this fixed point. This is a well-established thing with the transition of superfluids and so forth. It's exactly the same fixed point that this controversial theory flows to. It's a very specific statement. Number two, QED, whatever it is, is claimed to be a theory that is not time reversal invariant. For classical A, there was this Tooft anomaly, which means that the free fermion is time reversal invariant for any classical, for zero A, but with non-zero A, we had this anomaly and it wasn't really time reversal invariant. When we integrate over A, we cannot avoid the question of what happens when A is non-zero because we integrate over this. And that means that the theory is not really time reversal invariant. So three-dimensional QED with one flavor is not time reversal invariant. That's a statement. What does it do in the infrared? We claim that this is the same as the Wilson-Fisher theory, which is time reversal invariant. So the claim that this is not just a fixed point, but it's a known fixed point, is even more surprising because we start from a theory in the UV that does not have time reversal symmetry. In fact, that's the canonical example of a theory where time reversal is anomalous. So you start from a theory that classically has time reversal symmetry, and you go through a long discussion arguing that it's actually not time reversal invariant. And at the end of the day, it does become time reversal invariant, but with a different time reversal transformation. The time reversal transformation or the time reversal symmetry in the infrared is not the same time reversal that we saw in the UV that was violated. So the theory in the infrared has, has a new time reversal symmetry that acts non locally on the fermion psi. Question. These are massless fermions. Let me clarify your question. In general, when you want to say whether something is massive or massless, there is a natural way to discuss it. When the particle is massless, there is an enhanced symmetry. So you don't just declare what the parameters are, because what the parameters are can depend on your regularization, the way you define the theory at short distances. You use pauli villas or dimensional regularization, or you put it on the lattice, and you put it on the lattice one way or another. What you mean by mass could be different. But if there is a point with enhanced symmetry, you could say, aha, what I call m equals 0 is the point with enhanced symmetry. So you and I have different regularizations. What you call the mass is not what I call the mass. And I want to communicate with you and say, look, what I call m equals 0 is the point with the enhanced symmetry. That is known technically that this is a natural definition. Now, in this theory, in the free fermion theory, it's more tricky because the point m equals 0 does not have an enhanced symmetry. There's no enhanced symmetry at the point m equals 0. And therefore, it's a little tricky to say, what do you mean by m equals 0? There's no special symmetry. So I'm going to define m equals 0 as the point where there is a transition. This theory clearly has a transition because for mass positive and large, we have a fermion in the spectrum with positive mass. And for mass neg negative and large, we have a fermion with negative charge. So there must be a phase transition between them. I call m equals 0 the point of the phase transition. Now we can communicate, because we define what we mean by m equals 0. And then m equals 0, we claim, is a second order point. It could have been a first order point, but at least we know what we're talking about. So the claim here is about m equals 0. Now for the free fermion, 
this parameter m, or we called it mu, the mass of the fermion, breaks time reversal symmetry for the free fermion. In this theory, since we integrate over the gauge field, there isn't even such a symmetry. So there is no symmetry at this point. And indeed, if you go through the change of variables that I did here, the fermion mass from here is mapped to the boson mass here. And the point mu equals zero in this case, so let me write it explicitly. So psi bar psi is mapped to the operator phi absolute value square. And indeed, in this theory, mu equals zero is not any special as far as symmetry is concerned. Mu equals zero in this side is characterized by having a transition at that point. There is no symmetry that is enhanced at that point. And similarly, on the left-hand side. So this is. Yeah. If it's second order. But still, if, if it's first order, it's not long range. If it's second order, it is. No, it's, I, I, I would call mass zero when there is a particle. When there is a particle, I know what the mass means. This theory is not free. In lecture three, which spilled a little bit to the beginning of this one, the mass was meaningful because the theory in the infrared was a free theory. It was a free fermion. Now the theory in the infrared is interacting. So the notion of mass is not well defined. There is no mass of particle. There is a parameter in the Lagrangian. No, there is a deformation from the fixed point. And it is what it is. For? The, it, is a, it is irrelevant in the infrared. So it's relevant in the UV. The kinetic term or the chern simons term? The kinetic term is, is a relevant operator in the UV. It's, it dies in the infrared. So we get 1 over g squared times dB quantity square. And as g becomes big, 1 over g becomes small. And in this shorthand notation, I send it to 0. So you see, if I wanted to write the full Lagrangian, there would be more terms here. There would be 1 over g square. Eh, B square on this side, and on this side there would be 1 over g square, no, nope, sorry, A. And on this side there would be 1 over g hat square times D B square, and there would also be mu hat mu square and phi square, and there would also be a fermion mass here that we tuned. So there are all sorts of terms that either flow to zero or we tune them away. And in order not to write too many terms, I did not bother to write them. So this is shorthand notation. What we really mean is a UV theory with all possible couplings. We flow to the infrared. And after we flow to the infrared, we do not, either do not write them or write them with coefficient 1. It doesn't matter what they are. Or there are parameters that remain relevant in the infrared. So these are all the irrelevant parameters in the UV. I just don't bother to write them. And all the relevant parameters are tuned to a fixed point. So there's still a parameter. I need to explode the deformation. But we would still like to map the operators, because this is a very dramatic claim. So in order to make it more palatable, we would like to map the operators in more detail. So I discussed further the bilinear, because I was asked about it. But before we discuss the bilinear, we would like to ask, where did the fermion come from in this theory? This theory has no fermions. And conversely, where is the order parameter phi, the order parameter for the U1 breaking in the fermionic language? So I'm going to answer these two questions. And let me start from the fermionic theory. In the fermionic theory, this is QED. So it has a dynamical gauge field. And the rule is, whenever you see a dynamical gauge field, you should start in monopole operators. So this is a monopole operator for A. And the monopole operator for A, just by looking at this term and integrate by parts, we see that the monopole operator is charged under B. So it's an operator, it's a, it's a scalar operator, it carries spin zero, and it is charged under B. 
In this language, there is such a guy, which is phi itself. So we identify the monopole operator of A with phi itself. What about the fermion? This theory has a fermion. Should we identify it with anything in the bosonic theory? That's a question. Well, we don't have to. It's not gauge invariant, thank you. So get operators that are not gauge invariant, either we can multiply them by something else to make them gauge invariant, or we don't discuss them. So in this case, there is a fermion. Previously, the fermion was gauge invariant. It was charged under a global symmetry coupled to the classical field A, so we had to discuss it. Now, the fermion couples to a dynamical field, and therefore, we don't need to discuss it. So what do we have here? We have a theory that has a U1 symmetry acting on the local operator. We identified it on both sides. There is one relevant operator. So this is a relevant operator, and there is another relevant operator that does not carry any quantum numbers, and it's this guy. So we managed to relate them between the two sides. We can also consider deformations by, oh, I'm behind in time. We can consider deformations by the relevant operators. That's somewhat less interesting to do, turning this guy on, because it breaks the symmetry. So let's preserve the symmetry and turn on this guy. So now we're going to have massive QED on one side, and the Wilson-Fisher fixed point perturbed by this operator. So for the case of the bosonic side, we've already analyzed it before. This theory with positive mass, the U1 symmetry is unbroken. And since it's unbroken, there are massive particles, the phi quanta, which sit there, and there are massive particles. In the other phase, the global U1 symmetry is spontaneously broken, and there is a massless Goldstone boson. I am not going to do it in detail here, but the same thing can be obtained here by taking, considering the fermion and giving them a mass. So that leads to the same answer. So what we have seen is that what we have seen is that we derived a new duality, which answers a long-standing question: What does QED in three dimensions do? And the answer is something we already discussed before. So that's new. We don't need to, to learn about the new quantum field theory. And, we have, and this identification has passed some elementary tests. There are more tests that I'm not discussing here today, but they're in the literature. So that's what I wanted to say about this duality. But in a similar way, we can easily construct more dualities. So we could start, for example, from here. Let me erase all the irrelevant stuff. We don't need all this. <clears throat> we don't need all that. So this is QED. So it's a fermion with a dynamical gauge field coupled to a classical gauge field and some term. And that's just a purely bosonic theory. Once we have this duality, we can easily create more dualities in the same spirit I've done before. So for example, I can add to the two sides of the duality i k over 4 pi. BDC plus, sorry, this plus I over 4 pi. This is 2 pi because it's off diagonal. This is diagonal. I k over 4 pi <clears throat> BDB. So I can add this term to the two sides of the duality and then declare that big B is little b, i.e., I'm going to integrate over it. I'll manipulate the two sides, and I'll find something. And that something might or might not be interesting. I might be able to do it a few more times and generate many more theories that I can analyze this way and generate many more dualities. So this is a lot of fun because this is really a machine that spits out dual pairs. And you have to be careful when you do that, not to make mistakes, and be careful about the plus sign and the minus sign, etc. And a lot of that has already been done. But this leads to a whole set of new theories. So let me give you an example. And I'm not going to do the algebra on the blackboard because I've already done it a few times in these lectures. 
But let me write one example. So I can have one i psi bar d slash psi. And you can take it as an exercise for you to work out. It's really not a lot of work. i over 4 pi ABA plus i over 2 pi ABC plus i over 4 pi CDC. And I can even add the gravitational churn Simons that I suppressed before. And that's dual to d of phi, where plus phi to the fourth, the same as before, minus 2i over 4 pi, pdb, plus i over 2 pi. So let me say it in plain English or in words. The theory on the left-hand side is QED, namely a fermion, a single fermion coupled to a gauge field. And that gauge field has a U1. Before, we had U1 level a half. So this has a half buried in it. But now we add one more from here. So this is U1 level 3 halves. And it's coupled to some classical fields that we can suppress. So this is a cousin of QED. This is the same QED, but the gauge field also has another churn simons term. We could be interested in this theory with an arbitrary coefficient here. It would be U1 with an arbitrary k. Yes? Or which level? There's no k here. I added something like this with an appropriate k. I think you, you get this thing for k. If you take this thing, I think with k equals 2, either 2 or minus 2, you will end on, you will end on this. I think it's minus two. Well, there's a question of whether you edit or subtract it. And there's some mess in the minus signs in my notes, so I shouldn't say. But it's either two or minus two, and you will end on this. I'm happy to do the algebra on the board if you want. But this is really straightforward algebra. And it's identical to the algebra I did before twice. Once when I did this trick of adding such terms to the two sides of the particle vortex duality. And then I did it again this morning to derive QED. So it's identical to that. And in general, you can do it with an arbitrary coefficient here, as long as you do it on both sides. And you end with up with this. The, the, this was changed because of K. So we end up with U1 level 3 halves. So the naive QED has level a half. It always has to be half integer. And now we add one more. So we have 3 half. This is another theory we could be interested in, and people have been interested in this. QED with, with, with any number of fermions, with various levels for the churn simons gauge field. There's huge literature on the subject. I think even Spenter wrote on that, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir? Uh, the non-abelian. That's also interesting. We can discuss the non-abelian one. But so this theory has huge literature on it. And it couples to some background fields because it has a global U1 symmetry, so we can couple it to C. And the claim is, on the other side, this is again the Wilson-Fisher theory, but it's a gauge version. So it's coupled to U1 level minus 2. So both the theory on the right and the theory on the left are theories that there was an interest in them. The Wilson-Fisher theory can be gauged. And once it's gauged, it can be coupled to a churn simons term. And again, people have discussed that in the past. Here, the fermionic theory is QED. So it's already gauged. And you can add a churn simons term to it. This has been discussed in the past. And one might think, OK, we have two separate theories. But the duality claim is that this theory is the same as that one. So we put some order in this long list of possible fixed points in three dimensions by identifying some of them. Uh, the line, some of the line operators can be mapped, and some of them cannot be mapped. And in order to see which you, those that can really carry meaningful information as far as global symmetries can be mapped. Those that do not carry such meaningful information do not have to, do not have to match on the nose. In general, you can map, even for local operators, operators that are charged. 
if you have a charge operator here, charge operator, but then only those that are kind of the lowest dimension charge operator, because the others can mix. And you should also be able to map the relevant operator, because they tell you where you go on the renormalization group flow. The irrelevant ones are getting trickier. Yeah, in supersymmetric theories, you can do better, but here we don't have supersymmetry, so you cannot do better. Yes. In the first one. It's, it, it's, no. Yeah, this, yes, in the sense that yes, it's a good question, but the answer to the good question is no. There are two kinds of things in infrared duality. In, so duality is divided into two kinds. First, exact dualities. Example, n equals four super young mills. Another example, the Ising model with Kerma-Venier duality. That's first class. Class number two are infrared dualities. And in infrared dualities, they are again further divided into two categories. Category one, you have two different UV interacting theories that flow to the same fixed point. Case number two, one UV theory flows to another. And that's meaningful when this thing is infrared free. The distinction between them is not sharp. So for a given theory, the distinction is sharp. But if you start making deformations, it's not sharp. So imagine you take something like this, and you add a relevant operator. And you add here a relevant operator. Now this one might flow to a non-trivial fixed point. And this one will have to flow to the same non-trivial fixed point because of the duality. But now you say that this and that flow to the same infrared fixed point. So it looks more like this. And there could also be, you could also go the other way around with the appropriate deformations. So, so what do we have here? Here we have a fermion, so we have a free fermion coupled to a gauge field, and the relevant coupling here is the gauge coupling. So the relevant coupling here is the gauge coupling. And here it's the Wilson-Fisher theory. The relevant couplings are the 5 fourth in the gauge coupling. And the non-trivial claim is that they flow to the same point. I'm not going to do it here, but I want to mention that these, all these dualities are degenerate cases of a much richer structure with non-abelian gauge groups. So you can repeat the same story with non-abelian groups. So you have some fermions, and they couple to some SUN, and you have some bosons, and couple to some UN, and you can have turn Simon. So, so there are now lots of knobs that you can turn, changing the gauge group. It could be an orthogonal group or a unitary group, and you can change the churn simons level and so forth. And there are dualities between them, and there are lots of cross-checks. So this is a very rich subject. And one of the conclusions from this rich subject is that this particular theory which I presented two dual descriptions, really has more dual descriptions with non-abelian groups. So here Spenter should get the credit because he did study these theories with non-abelian groups. So for example, this particular example is the same as a fermion, or QED, or should I just say fermions, couple to SU2, level a half. And a half is, again, because there's a single doublet. And it's also dual to another theory, which is the Wilson-Fisher theory, coupled to SU2, level minus 2, A minus 1. So lots and lots of dualities. So lots of theories that you could have been interested in, bosons, fermions, coupled to this gauge group, that gauge group, with different levels. And they all can flow to so these theories are totally different in the UV. They have different degrees of freedom, different symmetries, and they all flow to the same infrared fixed point. So we have already discussed the fact that this theory and this theory flow to the same infrared fixed point. What's the global symmetry here? What's the global symmetry of this theory? We've discussed that. In my presentation, there was a classical background field that coupled to it.
it's this theory. It is coupled to a classical background field. What letter did I use for it? Well, that's, it's not a level because it's a classical field. It's U1. So this theory has a classical U1 symmetry. Actually, to be precise, it's O2 because there's also charge, there's also charge conjugation. This theory is this one, also has a classical U1 symmetry, the magnetic symmetry. So this one also has a U1. But if you write the global symmetry, you write the Lagrangians here, you will see that these two theories really have an SU2 global symmetry, or more precisely, SO3. So these theories have an SU2 global symmetry. And the non-trivial dualities tell us that they flow to the same infrared fixed point. So I haven't done that in, in these lectures. I'm just stating the fact. I'll soon make it more plausible. So the interesting statement is that these two theories that we were discussing before have a global U1 symmetry, and they flow to a fixed point that has an SO3 global symmetry. We have seen a lot of that in two dimensions. In two dimensions, if you have a compact boson with a generic radius, the global symmetry is U1, or U1 for the left movers and U1 for the right movers. As you change the radius, there is a quantum symmetry. The global symmetry becomes SU2. And it actually appears twice, once SU2 for the left movers and one SU2 for the right movers. That's well known. That's, I don't know, 70s or 60s, this is even before my time. We've also seen similar things in three dimensions in supersymmetric theories. There are theories that in the UV have a U1 symmetry and in the IR have an SU2 symmetry. That comes in, under the title of three-dimensional mirror symmetry. Now we see the same thing in a non-supersymmetric theory. So let me make it a little bit more plausible and give you some more insight of where this thing comes from. So the, the various theories that we discussed are various. The Wilson-Fisher, the O2 Wilson-Fisher fixed point, and it could be coupled to a U1 gauge field. And the U1 gauge field could have various levels. So the simplest one, which appeared yesterday, it was the Wilson-Fisher fixed point coupled to a gauge field, no chern simons term at all. This theory we showed in the first lecture is the same as the Wilson-Fisher fixed point without gauge fields. How is this duality called? This is the duality between the 5 4 theory and the 5 4 coupled to a gauge field. We gave it a name. We didn't give the name. The name was given by others. I repeated the name. That's particle vortex duality. That's known from the 70s. Today we learn that this theory is also the same as QED. This theory is the same as QED. Therefore, the other one is also the same as QED. And the natural order parameter is the monopole, operator, the monopole operator from here. And that was mapped to the scalar field of phi. Scalar field phi of this field. Then we also discussed the Wilson-Fisher theory with U1 level 1. So we take the same theory. If we have a gauge field without a churn simons term, it's the same as the Wilson-Fisher theory. Now we add churn simons level one. This theory is also dual to a theory that we like. What is it? Give you a hint somewhere on this blackboard. Well, it was yesterday. No, it is on the blackboard. This one? No, this is QED level one half. Look at the, at the far end of the blackboard. The free fermion. And the monopole operator is mapped to a fermion. Now, the monopole operator requires spin because of the ADA time, 
type coupling or the BDB type coupling in the Lagrangian. And the monopole operator, we said, always has, so the monopole operator, if we have K BDB, over four pi, the monopole operator has spin K over two. That appeared in the first lecture, or maybe the second. It appeared in the second lecture. This is the spin of the monopole operator in this Joe Simon's theory. So for k equals zero, we got a scalar, which we identify with this scalar. For k equals one, we get a fermion, spin a half, which we identify with the free fermion. And now we are discussing the Wilson Fisher with u1 level two, or minus two, it doesn't matter. And we found many dual theories. What's the spin of the monopole operator in this theory? One. So what can a, an operator of spin one be? What other operator of spin one are you familiar with? Sorry? A massless vector field is not gauge invariant. But an operator of dimension of spin one. Which operators have spin one? The quantum field theory that has I'll give you a hint. It might be conserved. Conserved current. So the monopole operator of this theory is mapped to a conserved current. So it is a, an operator of spin one in the UV, because it, there is such an operator in this theory, but it's not conserved. By the time we go to the infrared, its dimension goes down, it becomes conserved, and it combines with the global U1 symmetry that we see with the naked eye to make an SU2 global symmetry. So by looking at the UV, we see a U1 global symmetry. This is the magnetic symmetry. And we see that the lowest dimension operator, the lowest dimension operator charged under that global U1 symmetry has spin one. This doesn't mean that it's conserved, and therefore it doesn't mean that there's an SU2 global symmetry. But it does mean that as we go to the infrared, its dimension could go down, and it has the potential to become conserved, and the claim of the duality is that it is indeed conserved, and there is a global SU2 symmetry. I've already mentioned the analogy between this and the two-dimensional problem. In two dimensions, when we have a, comp a compact boson, there is a global U1 symmetry that shifts x, call it x, shifts x by a constant. And there are winding modes. And the winding modes carry charge under that U1 symmetry. And for large radius for the compact boson, the winding mode has very high dimension. But as we crank the, the radius down, the, the dimension of this winding mode comes down until it hits dimension one which is the dimension of a conserved current. And at that point, the global symmetry is enhanced to SU2. This is well, well understood. It's known as the Frankel-Katz construction, and it appears in string theory all over the map. And if you haven't studied that, I strongly encourage you to study this. What we see here is a three-dimensional cousin of the same phenomenon. But it's much more interesting because it happens in an interacting theory, whereas in two dimensions, it happens in a free field theory. And this phenomenon in interacting theories in three dimensions was also known in the supersymmetric theories. In supersymmetric theories, you often have a global symmetry that you see in the UV, which is a bunch of U1s. And in the infrared, these U1s become the Cartan subalgebra of a non-abelian group. And the extra elements that enhance the abelian group to a non-abelian group come from monopole operators. So this is well understood in supersymmetric theories, and now we see that the same phenomenon happens even in non-supersymmetric theories. And now you can ask your question. Which vector boson? I don't have any vector field. No, no, no okay. But, uh, when you said that it was interaction with a uh, gauge field, I, okay, I, I call it vector field, okay? So and now you have a partner, uh, you are trying to, to raise this uh, field to, to non-abelian one, right? 
Uh, so, I, so in this sense, I'm wondering, like, if you no, 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 no. I think you're you're mixing two different things. I yeah, see. Maybe. Thing number one, there is a dynamic. In this theory, there is a dynamical U1 gauge field. In yeah. These two theories. Okay. This dynamical U1 gauge field is not associated with any symmetry. Because whatever it couples to is coupled to a gauge field, and therefore it's not a it's not a new global symmetry. Yeah. Uh, okay. But given uh, that but, we have a yeah. U1 gauge field which is dynamical, it's not true for class. Yeah. So a classical gauge field is its own big yeah, okay, okay. conserved current. A quantum gauge field, yeah. like this one, it doesn't couple to a conserved, it couples to a conserved current, but there's no global symmetry. Uh -huh. Instead, there is a monopole operator and there is a magnetic symmetry. So one, whenever you have a, a dynamical U1 gauge field, there is a global U1 symmetry associated with it, but it's more subtle. The conserved current is F mu nu. Uh -huh. So that is the U1 that is being enhanced. The U1 that is being enhanced, its current is F mu nu. But in terms of states, no, uh, Akadi, new states do, do not appear. So Remember you answered before. Akadi, it's the same question. Yeah. You can either discuss states or you study okay, operators. Okay. Yeah, yeah, when you uh, ask what's the symmetry, you yeah. ask about operators. Yeah. When you ask how it is realized in the Hilbert space, you ask yeah. about states. That's a different thing. The question of what the operators are, that's something that you see in the UV. Mm -hmm. It's an independent of the dynamics, independent of the theory, we'll confine, we'll do this or that, we have phase transition, there would be a superconductor, we don't care. When you discuss states, you should analyze it separately for each value of the parameters, and especially when they are phase transitions. So in different phases, the symmetry might be realized differently. For example, it might be spontaneously broken, or it might not be spontaneously broken. So for any one of these dualities, you can turn on various mass terms, mm -hmm. positive or negative, explore all the phases, and analyze semi-classically what the spectrum looks like, and hope that you will be able to land on your feet. Namely, if you see a massive spin zero particle, here with some charges. You go to the other dis dual description, and again, you see the same particle. So for particles, it's a separate question. And in this case, we can ask, is the symmetry spontaneously broken or not? Is it explicitly broken, et cetera, et cetera. In this description, the new symmetry, that I, so the U1 is there, the global U1. Yeah. Where was my diagram? This global U1 is there everywhere. And the monopole operators are charged under it and the particles in the various phases are charged under it. There is, among other things, a particle in some phases. This U1, in the phase where this U1 is unbroken, there are massive particles with spin one. That's a massive particle. It has spin one, not a conserved current, no nothing. There's no SU2 symmetry. There's no SU2 global symmetry. The statement about the enhanced SU2 symmetry is only about the infrared. Mm -hmm. Not about taking the UV theory and turning on masses. So when you want to discuss particles, that's a separate question. And in here in the UV, it's not going to shed any light on it. Having said that, you can discuss these two theories. In these two theories, the full SU2 is visible in the UV. And therefore, in each phase of these, the SU2 should act, either should act on the spectrum if the SU2 is unbroken, or be spontaneously broken and there will be Goldstone bosons. So you can analyze all that, and it has been analyzed, and it actually works. But that would be a lot more work. But you see, there are many theories and many parameters, and for every one of them, there's positive and negative. But, so there's a lot of work to do, and, and it was done. Okay, I, I reached a natural point to stop. And I really said a tiny fraction of what I planned to say. Well, give about a half of what I planned to say. And it is a tiny fraction of what is already known about these dualities. But I hope I gave you the necessary background to read these papers, things that are hard to find in the literature, like the proper statement of the anomaly and some introduction, introductory comments on churn simons theories, which allow you to read the papers. I should just mention that we discussed boson-boson dualities. That's known from the 70s. Yesterday and today, we discussed boson-fermion dualities. And you can iterate these and find also fermion-fermion dualities. So 
So that's one direction you can take it. You can also change the gauge group in all sorts of different ways. You can also change the potential. If you have the gauge group is sufficiently complicated, you have enough scalars. Instead of having just one scalar, you have several scalars. And then you can write different terms in the potential that break the symmetry. There are different global symmetries. And there is a very rich structure of fixed points that you can find in one description. And any one of them might or might not have some dual description using totally different degrees of freedom. So it's a huge zoo of examples that can be studied. And some of them already have applications in condensed matter physics. In fact, some of these things were motivated by applications in condensed matter physics. Some of them were actually done by condensed matter physicists. Not quite in this language. So I feel that there is a lot that can be done. I even prepared here a lot of things that I did not cover. And I hope that the young people in the audience could take it up and push it forward. So I'll stop here.